Chapter 11 How George, once upon a time, got up early in the morning. George, Harris, and Montmorency do not like the look of the cold water. Heroism and determination on the part of Jay. George in his shirt. Story with a moral. Harris as a crook. Historical retrospect, specially inserted for the use of schools. I woke at six the next morning and found George awake too. We both turned round and tried to go to sleep again, but we could not. Had there been any particular reason why we should not have gone to sleep again, but have got up and dressed then and there, we should have dropped off while we were looking at our watches and have slept till ten. As there was no earthly necessity for our getting up under another two hours at the very least, and our getting up at that time was an utter absurdity, it was only in keeping with the natural cussedness of things in general that we should both feel that lying down for five minutes more would be death to us. George said that the same kind of thing, only worse, had happened to him some 18 months ago when he was lodging by himself in the house of a certain Mrs. Gippings. He said his watch went wrong one evening and stopped at a quarter past eight. He did not know this at the time because, for some reason or other, he forgot to wind it up when he went to bed, an unusual occurrence with him and hung it up over his pillow without ever looking at the thing. It was in the winter when this happened, very near the shortest day, and a week of fog into the bargain, so that it was still very dark when George woke up in the morning, and was no guide to him as to the time. He reached up and hauled down his watch. It was a quarter past eight. "'Angels and ministers of grace defend us!' exclaimed George. "'And here have I got to be in the city by nine! Why didn't somebody call me? Oh, this is a shame!' And he flung the watch down and sprang out of bed and had a cold bath and washed himself and dressed himself and shaved himself in cold water because it was not time to wait for the hot and then rushed and had another look at the watch. Whether the shaking it had received, whether the shaking it had received and being thrown down on the bed had started it or how it was, George could not say, but certain was that from a quarter past eight it had begun to go and now pointed to twenty minutes to nine. George snatched it up and rushed downstairs. In the sitting room, all was dark and silent. There was no fire, no breakfast. George said it was a wicked shame of Mrs. G, and he made up his mind to tell her what he thought of her when he came home in the evening. Then he dashed on his great coat and hat and, seizing his umbrella, made for the front door. The door was not even unbolted. George anathematized Mrs. G for a lazy old woman and thought it was very strange that people could not get up at a decent respectable time unlocked and unbolted the door and ran out. He ran hard for a quarter of a mile and at the end of that distance it began to be borne in upon him as a strange and curious thing that there were so few people about and that there were no shops open. It was certainly a very dark and foggy morning, but still it seemed an unusual course to stop all business on that account. He had to go to business. Why should other people stop in bed merely because it was dark and foggy? At length he reached Holborn. Not a shutter was down. Not a bus was about. There were three men in sight, one of whom was a policeman, a market cart full of cabbages and a dilapidated looking cab. George pulled out his watch and looked at it. It was five minutes to nine. He stood still and counted his pulse. He stooped down and felt his legs. Then, with his watch still in his hand, he went up to the policeman and asked if he knew what time the time was. "'What's the time?' said the man, eyeing George up and down with evident suspicion. "'Why, if you listen, you will hear it strike!' George listened, and a neighboring clock immediately obliged. "'But it's only gone three said George in an injured tone when it had finished. Well, and how many did you want it to go? replied the constable. Why, nine, said George, showing him his watch. Do you know where you live? said the guardian of public order severely. George thought and gave the address. Oh, that's where it is, is it? replied the old man. Well, you take my advice and go there quietly and take that watch of yours with you and don't let's have any more of it. And George went home again, musing as he walked along and let himself in. At first, when he got in, he determined to undress and go to bed again. But when he thought of the redressing and rewashing and the having of another bath, he determined he would not, but would sit up and go to sleep in the easy chair. But he could not get to sleep. He never felt more wakeful in his life. So he lit the lamp and got out the chessboard and played himself a game of chess. But even that did not enliven him. It seemed slow somehow. 
so he gave chess up and tried to read. He did not seem able to take any sort of interest in reading either, so he put on his coat again and went out for a walk. It was horribly lonesome and dismal, and all the policemen he met regarded him with undisguised suspicion and turned their lanterns on him and followed him about, and this had such an effect upon him that at last that he began to feel as if he really had done something, and he got to slinking down the by streets and hiding in dark doorways when he heard the regulation flip-flop approaching. Of course, this conduct made the force only more distrustful of him than ever, and they would come and rout him out and ask him what he was doing there, and when he answered nothing, he had merely come out for a stroll. It was then four o'clock in the morning. They looked as though they did not believe him, and two plainclothes constables came home with him to see if he really did live where he said he did. They saw him go in with his key, and then they took up a position opposite and watched the house. He thought he would light a fire when he got inside and make himself some breakfast just to pass the time, but he did not seem able to handle anything from a scuttleful of coals to a teaspoon without dropping it or falling over it and making such a noise that he was in mortal fear that it would wake Mrs. G up and that she would think it was burglars and open the window and call police and then these two detectives would rush in and handcuff him and march him off to the police court. He was in a morbidly nervous state by this time, and he pictured the trial and his trying to explain the circumstances to the jury, and nobody believing him, and his being sentenced to 20 years penal servitude, and his mother dying of a broken heart. So he gave up trying to get breakfast, and wrapped himself up in his overcoat, and sat in the easy chair till Mrs. G came down at half past seven. We had been... He said he had never got up too early since that morning. It had been such a warning to him. We had been sitting huddled up in our rugs while George had been telling me this true story, and on his finishing it, I set to work to wake Harris up with a skull. The third prod did it, and he turned over on the other side and said he would be down in a minute and that he would have his lace-up boots. We soon let him know where he was, however, by the aid of the hitcher, and he sat up suddenly, sending Montmorency, who had been sleeping the, the sleep of the just, right on the middle of his chest, sprawling across the boat. Then we pulled up the canvas, and all four of us poked our heads out over the offside and looked down at the water and shivered. The idea, overnight, had been that we should get up early in the morning, fling off our rugs and shawls, and throwing back the canvas, spring into the river with a joyous shout and revel in a long, delicious swim. Somehow, now the morning had come, the notion seemed less tempting. The water looked damp and chilly. The wind felt cold. Well... "'Who's going to be first in?' said Harris at last. "'There was no rush for precedence. "'George settled the matter, so far as he was concerned, "'by retiring into the boat and pulling on his socks. "'Montmorency gave vent to an involuntary howl, "'as if merely thinking of the thing had given him the horrors, "'and Harris said it would be so difficult to get into the boat again, "'and went back and sorted out his trousers. "'I did not altogether like to give in, "'though I did not relish the plunge.' There might be snags about, or weeds, I thought. I meant to compromise matters by going down to the edge and just throwing the water over myself. So I took a towel and crept out on the bank and wormed my way along onto the branch of a tree that dipped down into the water. It was bitterly cold. The wind cut like a knife. I thought I would not throw the water over myself after all. I would go back into the boat and dress, and I turned to do so, and, as I turned... The silly branch gave way, and I and the towel went in together with a tremendous splash, and I was out midstream with a gallon of Thames water inside me before I knew what had happened. By Jove, old Jay's gone in, I heard Harris say as I came blowing up to the surface. I didn't think he'd have the pluck to do it, did you? Is it all right? sung out George. Lovely, I spluttered back. You are duffers not to come in. I wouldn't have missed this for worlds. Why won't you try it? It's only once a little determination. But I could not persuade them. Rather an amusing thing happened while dressing that morning. I was very cold when I got back into the boat, and in my hurry to get my shirt on, I accidentally jerked it into the water. It made me awfully wild, especially as George burst out laughing. I could not see anything to laugh at, and I told George so, and he only laughed the more. I never saw a man laugh so much. I quite lost my temper with him at last, and I pointed out to him what a driveling maniac of an imbecile idiot he was, but he only roared the louder. And then, just as I was landing 
the shirt, I noticed that it was not my shirt at all, but George's, which I had mistaken for mine, whereupon the humor of the thing struck me for the first time, and I began to laugh. And the more I looked from George's wet shirt to George, roaring with laughter, the more I was amused, and I laughed so much that I had to let the shirt fall back into the water again. Aren't you... You going to get it out, said George between his shrieks. I could not answer him at all for a while. I was laughing so. But at last, between my peals, I managed to jerk out, It isn't my shirt. It's yours. I never saw a man's face change from lively to severe so suddenly in all my life before. What? he yelled, springing up. You silly cuckoo. Why can't you be more careful what you're doing? Why the deuce don't you go and dress on the bank? You're not fit to be in a boat, you're not. Give me the hitcher. I tried to make him see the fun of the thing, but he could not. George is very dense at seeing a joke sometimes. Harris proposed that we should have scrambled eggs for breakfast. He said he would cook them. It seemed, from his account, that he was very good at doing scrambled eggs. He often did them at picnics and went out on yachts. He was quite famous for them. People who had once tasted his scrambled eggs, so we gathered from his conversation, never cared for any food afterwards, but pined away and died when they could not get them. It made our mouths water to hear him talk about the things, and we handed him out the stove and the frying pan and all the eggs that had not smashed and gone over everything in the hamper, and begged him to begin. He had some trouble in breaking the eggs, or rather, not so much trouble in breaking them exactly as in getting them into the frying pan when broken, and keeping them off his trousers, and preventing them from running up his sleeve. But he fixed some half a dozen into the pan at last, and then squatted down by the side of the stove and chivied them about with a fork. It seemed harassing work, so far as George and I could judge. Whenever he went near the pan, he burned himself, and then he would drop everything and dance around the stove, flicking his fingers about and cursing the things. Indeed, every time George and I looked round at him, he was sure to be performing this feat. We thought at first that it was a necessary part of the culinary arrangements. We did not know what scrambled eggs were, and we fancied that it must be some Red Indian or Sandwich Island sort of dish that required dances and incantations for its proper cooking. Montmorency went and put his nose over it once, and the fat spluttered up and scalded him, and then he began dancing and cursing. Altogether, it was one of the most interesting and exciting operations I have ever witnessed. George and I were both quite sorry when it was over. The result was not altogether the success that Harris had anticipated. There seemed so little to show for the business. Six eggs had gone into the frying pan, and all that came out was a teaspoonful of burnt and unappetizing-looking mess. Harris said it was the fault of the frying pan and thought it would have gone better if we had a fish kettle and a gas stove, and we decided not to attempt the dish again until we had those aids to housekeeping by us. The sun had got more powerful by the time we had finished breakfast, and the wind had dropped and it was as lovely a morning as one could desire. Little was in sight to remind us of the 19th century, and as we looked out upon the river in the morning sunlight, we could almost fancy that the centuries between us and that ever-to-be-famous June morning of 1215 had been drawn aside, and that we, English yeoman's sons in homespun cloth with dirk at belt, were waiting there to witness the writing of that stupendous page of history, the meaning whereof was to be translated to the common people some four hundred and odd years later by one Oliver Cromwell, who had deeply studied it. <clears throat> it is a fine summer morning, sunny, soft, and still. But through the air there runs a thrill of coming stir. King John has slept at Duncroft Hall, and all the day before the little town of Staines has echoed to the clang of armed men, and the clatter of great horses over its rough stones, and the shouts of captains, and the grim oaths and surely jests of bearded bowmen, billmen, pikemen, and strange-speaking foreign spearmen. Gay cloaked companies of knights and squires have ridden in, all travel stained and dusty, and all the evening long the timid townsmen's doors have had to be quick open to let in rough groups of soldiers for whom there must be found both board and lodging, and the best of both, or woe betide the house and all within, for the sword is judge and jury, plaintiff and executioner, 
in these tempestuous times and pays for what it takes by sparing those from whom it takes it if it pleases to do so. Round the campfire in the marketplace gather still more of the baron's troops and eat and drink deep and bellow forth roistering drinking songs and gamble and quarrel as the evening grows and deepens into night. The firelight sheds quaint shadows on their piled up arms and on their uncouth forms. The children of the town seal round to watch them, wondering, and brawny country wenches, laughing, draw near to bandy alehouse jest and jibe with the swaggering troopers so unlike the village swains, who now despise stand apart behind with vacant grins upon their broad peering faces. And out from the fields around glitter the faint lights of more distant camps, as here some great lord's followers lie mustered, and there false John's French mercenaries hover like crouching wolves without the town. And so, with sentinel in each dark street, and twinkling watchfires on each height around, the night has worn away, and over this fair valley of old Thames has broken the morning of the great day that is so too close, so big, with the fate of ages yet unborn. He was to close so big. To close so big. Yes. Ever since gray dawn in the lower of the two islands, just above where we are standing, there has been great clamor and the sound of many workmen. The great pavilion brought there yester eve is being raised, and carpenters are busy nailing tiers of seats, while prentices from London town are there with many colored stuffs and silks and cloth of gold and silver. And now, lo, down upon the road that winds along the river's bank from stains, there come towards us, laughing and talking together in deep guttural bass. Base, Maria, they're not fish. Base, a half a score of stalwart halbert men, barons men, these, and halt at a hundred yards or so above us on the other bank and lean upon their arms and wait. And so from hour to hour, march up along the road, ever fresh groups and bands of armed men, their casks and breastplates flashing back the long low lines of morning sunlight. Until as far as I can reach, the way seems thick with glittering steel and prancing steeds, and shouting horsemen are galloping from group to group, and little banners are fluttering lazy lazily in the warm breeze, and every now and then there is a deeper stir as the ranks make way on either side, and some great baron on his war horse, with his guard of squires around him, passes along to take his station at the head of his serfs and vassals. And up the slope of Cooper's Hill, just opposite, are gathered the wondering rustics and curious townsfolk, who have run from stains, and none are quite sure what the bustle is about, but each one has a different vision of the great event that they have come to see. And some say that much good to all the people will come from this day's work, but the old men shake their head, for they have heard such tales before. And all the river down to stains is dotted with small craft and boats and tiny coracles, which last are growing out of favor now and are only used by the poorer folk. Over the rapids, where in after years trim bell weir lock will stand, they have been forced or dragged by their sturdy rowers and are now crowding up as near as they dare, come to the great covered barges which lie in readiness to bear King John to where the fateful charter waits his signing. <coughs> Excuse me. It is noon, and we and all the people have been waiting patient for many an hour, and the rumor has run round that Slippery John has escaped from the Baron's grasp, and has stolen away from Duncroft Hill with his mercenaries at his heels, and will soon be doing other work than signing charters for his people's liberty. Not so. This time the grip upon him has been one of iron, and he has slid and wriggled in vain. Far down the road, a little cloud of dust has risen and draws nearer and grows larger, and the pattering of many hoofs grows louder, and in and out between the scattered groups of drawn-up men, there pushes on its way a brilliant cavalcade of gay-dressed lords and knights, and front and rear and either flank there ride the yeomen of the barons, and in the midst, King John. He rides to where the barges lie in readiness, and the great barons step forth from their ranks to meet him. 
he greets them with a smile and laugh and pleasant honeyed words, as though it were some feast in his honor to which he had been invited. But as he rises to dismount, he casts one hurried glance from his own French mercenaries drawn up in the rear to the grim ranks of the baron's men that hem him in. Is it too late? One fierce blow at the unsuspecting horseman at his side, one cry to his French troops, one desperate charge upon the unready lines before him, and these rebellious barons might rue the day they dared to thwart his plans. A bolder hand might have turned the game even at that point. Had it been a Richard there, the cup of liberty might have been dashed from England's lips, and the taste of freedom held back for a hundred years. But the heart of King John sinks before the stern faces of the English fighting men, and the arm of King John drops back onto his rein, and he dismounts and takes his seat in the foremost barge. And the barons follow him, follow in, with each mailed hand upon the sword hilt, and the world is given to let go. The word is given to let go. The world can stay. Slowly, the heavy, bright-decked barges leave the shore of running mead. Slowly, against the swift current, they work their ponderous way, till, with a low grumble, they grate against the bank of the little island that from this day will bear the name of Magna Carta Island. And King John has stepped upon the shore, and we wait in breathless silence till a great shout cleaves the air, and the great cornerstone in England's Temple of Liberty has, now we know, been firmly laid. <laughs>